so yeah getting this thing started would you be able to give us a little bit about yourself your work and anything else that you want to get into sure yeah um so i got i became interested in spirituality about five years ago when i first read um it was actually a book by uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the monk. He's a Buddhist monk, and he introduced me to mindfulness through his through his work. Um, and I started getting interested in meditation, and I started practicing it daily. And it was really, you know, changing a lot for me. I was I was suffering from a lot of depression and anxiety at the time, and it was really starting to uh, shift me a lot. And then it was uh, a little bit after that I read Eckhart Tolle's book, A New Earth, mm-hmm. and that was the one that really just changed everything for me. It put me on this whole course, on this whole path. So yeah, it's been five years of just, I guess, you know, learning, gaining spiritual knowledge and doing my own spiritual work. And now um, I sort of give back on YouTube by taking a lot of the things that I learned and trying and explaining them in a simple way that anybody can understand and apply to their life. So that's basically where I'm at now with that. Awesome. Yeah. So how would you explain what that book by Thich Nhat Hanh showed you and what A New Earth showed you? How did this change your perspective altogether? Yeah. um, So a lot of what I was struggling with, a lot of my suffering and probably everybody's was due to entirely due to my own thoughts. Mm-hmm. And you don't realize this until you become aware of it, until somebody points it out to you. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people get started. So when I s- learned about mindfulness, um, that's just sort of where I started realizing like, oh, I think everything that I've been struggling with is just due to thinking about the past or thinking about the future. That's um, it. So that that was kind of the the insight. That was sort of my probably my first spiritual waking because it's not, a, not enough to just... Um, conceptually understand that it's something that has to really like you have to really internally like grasp it i guess you could say Mm -hmm. and um yeah that was like the most profound thing that i learned and i still to this day is i still hold on to that as being like one of the most valuable things that i've ever learned and that still helps me and just that everything is mind really Mm. um and then i guess the new earth was um it's been a while since I read it, but just all of Eckhart Tolle's work, you know, The Power of Now, he's sort of the same thing, but he goes more in depth. Thich Nhat Hanh keeps things very like, kind of simple, like, you know, just breathe, just focus on the moment, which I really like. But I guess Eckhart Tolle in his book, A New Earth, kind of uh, went a little more in depth with a lot of that. And, you know, he's, he's a very intelligent guy. You know, I think he went to like Oxford, so he's very good at explaining things. And I, I like, um, I don't like to just believe everything I hear. I like to really try to understand why the why behind things so yeah um and then you know just that led me to some other learning a lot about buddhism and uh you know non-duality and hinduism and taoism and all of these other spiritual teachings so Mm -hmm. yeah nice yeah what about you uh what about how do i get on this wavelength yeah oh that's a long story and i never know how to answer it uh hard i did read the new earth yeah it's very it's very difficult to get to a point like how did this start you know was it the previous lifetime or one before that who knows (laughs) was it in this lifetime but from what i can remember it was pretty similar to yours a sense of mental illness really Hmm. just anxiety depression just um at odds with life in the world and that somehow led me into the path of or the mindset of there's got to be another way there's got to be another way there has to be there has to be and then yeah how did i get on that other way i don't know but how it started was just through mental suffering i think that's how a lot of us Hmm. get on the this wavelength it's like there's gotta be there has to be a different way and the different way is is not necessarily like changing up your lifestyle, even though it is that comes into it. But it, the basis of it, as you described, is changing up how you see all of this, the craziness mm-hmm. of the world and your life and the comings and goings of the mind. It's the conscious perspective. That's why I call the podcast the conscious perspective, because it really comes down to is changing your perspective 
on all the things that you think cause you anguish. So yeah, summing that up, it's just like uh, getting to a point of exhaustion, right? Which I think a lot of people can relate to exhaustion. And then from that exhaustion, somehow just being guided into finding teachers like Thich Nhat Hanh, Eckhart Tolle, um, and many, many others, Ram Das, I love Ram Das. Mm, yeah. Many, many others, you know? And uh, that's pretty much it, man, without getting too much into it. It's just um, finding another way, and another way is the way. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate you know? that. I relate to that a lot. I like how you said you don't necessarily have to change your lifestyle because I think a lot of people can get caught up in the fact that, like, you kind of have this awakening experience and then you think, like, okay, well, I have to just leave everything and go live in the woods but um mm. you don't necessarily have to change anything in your lifestyle although usually you will but it's it's more about just changing the way you see things changing your perspective so i think yeah. that that's that's really uh important mm -hmm. yeah and i think also there does it's both like there there is a sort of changing in lifestyle that comes from it but at the same time is the essence of being in the world and not of it not of the world yeah yeah in the buddha's story this is something that a lot of people overlook is he did go out become enlightened under the bodhi tree he left the kingdom but he also came back to teach mm -hmm. that's a very important part of the story is he didn't just stay out into the woods he came back to to give back, as you mentioned, you know, through your YouTube channel, you kind of give back a little bit. So I think that's um, that's an important part of the yogic path or the path of the sage is you have this realization you might enter a sort of hermit mode for a little bit. Mm. But then you realize that that's not the end of the journey, per se. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the journey might lead to giving back a little bit, serving a little. I don't think necessarily everyone has to serve. Not everyone has to have a podcast or a YouTube channel for sure. But there is a inclination to serve, right? And I feel as though with enough understanding within oneself, you almost have to serve. I mean, you don't have, we don't have to do anything. I right. understand that. But do you feel as, let me ask you this one. Do you feel as though you almost have to give back? Like that's just part of the process and part of the journey? A hundred percent. No, I, I, I agree. I, I think that the lifestyle change will come very naturally. I don't yeah. think it should be forced. And for me, it was like you said, it was the hermit phase for maybe a couple of years. It, it, this all happened right when COVID started, when we were in the lockdown mm -hmm. and stuff. So um, I, in some sense, I was grateful for that because that's it forced me to almost like really look at myself. So I went through that phase of being a hermit. And then, yeah. And then I don't know, all of a sudden it just hit me. It's like, I don't want to keep this to myself because you, you just your whole life changes like you know everything changes yeah. and you you have all these realizations it's like you, you don't want to just sit around and meditate all day like you want to share it with you want to help other people i would mm -hmm. say that to answer your question i would say most people in this space are gonna feel called to give back in some way whether that's becoming a therapist or becoming a yoga teacher or doing a podcast everybody might have their own unique way of wanting to give back or maybe it's even just still living a normal worldly life but just treating people better in your everyday experiences or being a more inspiring, better person. Um, I, I have, I, I feel like to me that it's just something that comes with the territory of this whole path, you know? Yeah, I agree. Because it's like, how can I not? Yeah. Exactly. Just a little bit, right? Right. You, know, you don't have to go out and try and save the world, be Superman, but just a little bit. Even if it's just in the little moments, might be a cliche, but even if it's just in the little moments with all of the interactions that we have in our life, just uh, recognize that somebody else is essentially part of you and they're going through it too. They're also suffering. So how can you sort of mitigate one's suffering in the moment just by, just by, I don't know, depends actually, it depends on the circumstance, but it really just is by the recognition of that the person isn't separate from you, right? Well, the, all of these people aren't separate from you. They're a part of you. And from that work, from that place. And that's where this inclination comes from, in my being at least, is like looking into someone's eyes and seeing myself, essentially. You know? It's, 
I think yeah. like the more that you have that non-dual awakening and you see the oneness and everything, like you have no other choice but to want to help all because you see that everybody is within you and you're in with every, yeah. with everybody. So it's like, what other option do you have? You know exactly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so apparent. It's so apparent too. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. I could try. You could try no, and run away it, as much yeah, as you, you want. You can't. Once you've gone, to, gotten to the length that we're at, it's you can't go back. You know, this is it. And I'm, I'm, I love it. You know, and it's interesting because it makes you really actually appreciate your suffering. It makes you, it makes me appreciate mm. the times where I felt different from everybody else. And like, I just always knew that there was something more for me other than just the typical, like, you know, yeah, typical surface level life. Mm -hmm. And now looking back, like all of that kind of makes sense. It all kind of clicks of why mm -hmm. I always felt that way. You know, I, not to sound too much like I'm this, you know, enlightened guru, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people have this realization that there was a, there was a kind of a reason for everything. Like it all kind of um, unfolded in a way that it was meant to, you know? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I believe that we all have this yearning. Mm. We have this inclination to serve deep down or this, um, yeah, this call, as you said, to awaken, but we're never really instructed on how to go about it. We are completely conditioned to the opposite. We're completely conditioned into illusions of separation and just mm -hmm. so much delusion, right? But it's always there and we try to find it. And this is coming from my point of view. I would always try and find it and fill fill the void, you could say, with worldly stuff, mm -hmm. right? Just with uh, gluttony and mm -hmm. video games and women and drugs. Yeah, just trying yeah. to just fill, just trying to fill something, right? That could right. truly never be filled. And that's the problem: is that we all we can all recognize it, but we don't. We just don't know how to go about it. And that's the wonder of people like Eckhart Tolle and you and Thich Nhat Hanh and Ram Dass is they, they figured it out per se, and you can follow in their footsteps, not necessarily directly how they did it, but you can take stuff from their life to go about finding out how you can find this inner peace that they found. And that's the beauty of it, man. The times that we live in, there's plenty of examples, right? There's plenty, plenty, like just, just so much. It's actually a miracle of how many examples there are for us to um, that pave the way for us to mm. find this inner light of living that um, is truly priceless. You know, yeah. it's a miracle that we're even just doing this right now. No, it really is. <laughs> Why do you think? Um, like I was the same way with the drugs, and I I struggled with addiction for uh, you know a lot of my twenties. And like you said, I didn't, I just didn't realize, like I was just looking in the wrong places, you know, I wasn't yeah. looking in within, I wasn't realizing that it was actually just, I had to just sit and literally breathe. <laughs> that was so body. simple. Yeah. Why do you think like some people are attracted to this path, but others just have no interest or there's just, they just don't like they, like everybody do ha does have an inner yearning for it, but it just doesn't mm. always come out for everybody. That's a tough question to answer. I know, so. I know. I think about it and I just can't quite figure it out. Like, I mean, I don't expect you to have like an actual answer, but. Yeah, I don't have a, a true answer because I don't know. I asked that. I actually ask that question a lot to people mm. <laughs> and I get different answers every time. But I think it ultimately, I'll give you something. I'll give the audience something. I think maybe it's because the people that don't get the message haven't reached that point of exhaustion that we talked exactly. about before. Yeah. I think right? that's it. And um, yeah, I think it's really that simple because um, Ramana, I'm sorry, uh, Yogananda actually asked that to Ramana Maharshi. He said, uh, how do we, uh, what was it? I'll try and find the exact quote. I'll put it at the bottom of the video. Mm. But he said, why do we have to suffer so much, Ramana? Why can't we just know God? And uh, Ramana said, there's no other way. Pretty much in the human form, you sort of have to suffer in order to have this realization. That's just the blueprint. That's just the way things were created. We mm. sort of have to get to a point of exhaustion within our suffering in order to get to that point of there's got to be another way. And that ultimately brings us to God. You don't even have to say God. You can say self-realization, the infinite, the divine, whatever it is. But I think just in the blueprint of life, how this whole matrix was created is you have to you have to know what isn't it 
what I like to say, what isn't it until you get to a point where you want to find out what is it. Right. That's the essence of it, man. So yeah, those people just haven't reached it yet. But I think ultimately in time, we'll all get there. You know, we'll all get to the point of exhaustion. Right. And I think it's accelerating at this point in time is an acceleration of our karma, you could say. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's many, many, many people all over the globe that are getting the message, um, heeding the call, the call of duty, (laughs) duty to the divine. And uh, yeah, they're picking up the phone. I always say that I'll stop doing this podcast when I stop finding new people to talk to and continually always finding new people. And these are the people that are outward about it, right? There's plenty of people that are behind the scenes. They don't have YouTube channels that are having Mm -hmm. this awakening. Probably plenty of people that are listening and that's completely fine. But my point is, is that there's plenty of examples out there of this change going on with people like you. And that's another part of the miraculous times we're living in. Somehow something's going on in the, in the zeitgeist for all of us to get this message and uh, finally wake up to who we truly are and what we're actually supposed to do here as a collective. Mm. I love that. I think uh, in a very practical sense too, it just has to do with the internet. Like I really think that the message is just spreading like back in the days of Ramana Maharshi and those guys, like you had to literally travel to India and sit in lectures (laughs) where in a country, if you lived in America where Christianity was it, you know, it was just, you just didn't know anything else. But now it's like you're just you can just click a few buttons and you have all of this amazing information, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think that that definitely um, probably plays a role as well, you know. One hundred percent. If I didn't have the Internet, I don't think I would be able to understand any of this stuff because most of my all of my, I would say. Um, teachings and understandings, guidance came from the Internet. Right. Of course. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a double edged sword, though, because you could use the internet to for your best um for your best interest of being able to see this and understand this stuff self-realization mm-hmm. or you could also get lost in the darkness and distraction as well so it's all about how we use this technology i agree but yeah if you use it to your best ability you can really become enlightened i truly believe that you don't have to go to india india can come to you <laughs> <laughs> exactly i think that's like one of the most important lessons that i've learned and and you know all the sages have said this too is like you really don't have to go anywhere physically like everything you need whether you're sitting in the middle of times square or you're at a mountain in india like everything's up here the, mm-hmm. you know the ability to attain enlightenment for moksha for liberation whatever you call it for that infinite consciousness to really reach that state it's always just going to be here um mm-hmm. you know i mean th- i think going places can definitely help it can maybe accelerate it having the right teachers and the right environment uh but i don't think it's entirely necessary personally no you know yeah that's what it's all about man is bringing it back home and having that subjective direct understanding i was gonna say experience but it's not really an experience it can appear as an experience but it's more than just an experience like going on a roller coaster or something Mm. it's uh, an understanding that stays with you it's almost Mm. like something switches in your brain the switch right exactly you switch something on and then you can see you know the light comes on the light bulb comes on and yeah never really comes off (laughs) yeah (laughs) it can dim you can dim a little. You can bit. dim. You get on. You get caught up in worldly life. It dims a yeah. little bit, but it never really fully goes out. You know. Yeah, that's the beauty of it, man. Ah, yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I'm <laughs> just kind of basking in that for a little bit. Um, well, let me ask you this one: How would you say we actually bring this understanding into ourselves? Do you think it revolves all around? meditation and general self inquiry i think you spoke of it before it really just comes down to being still right just kind of mm-hmm. yeah letting go of the world a little bit would you say that's the essence of it though is just um having a regular meditation practice at least in the beginning in the beginning 100 percent, i would say regular meditation but you got to be careful because like i think people think of meditation as it's like all right well i'm gonna sit for 20 minutes and do meditation and, you know, then I'm good for the day. Then I can go and, you know, be a dick to all these people and just whatever. I think that the, the the ultimate goal is even if you're just doing that 20 minutes of meditation practice, the goal is to always be with that increased awareness. Yeah. Always, which um, 
you know, in the past five years, am I there all the time, 24 seven? No, but it, it gets to a point where you don't even really have to like sit down and meditate anymore. It's just, mm. you know, your consciousness and your awareness increases so much that uh, it, it just becomes like, like how your mind always just resorts to constantly thinking. Now it resorts to constantly just being in the presence and present yeah. moment, you know? Um, but it takes a lot, you know, I, I, it's not because I'm special. I really put a lot of work into it and it's, I made it the most important thing to me. I think, I think a lot of people struggle really to just even sit down and meditate for five, 10 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And that's the most, I would say in the beginning, like that's the most important part is to just have that discipline to do that. Uh, you know, for the, and you will like even just a couple of months, maybe a couple of weeks. I mean, everybody will be different, but you will see, you know, you will start to shift. You will start to change. You have to trust that you will. Yes. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, I would say that that meditation in the beginning is extremely important, but then it's more about under, you even evolve out of meditation and you just realize it's more about like this realization of oneness and, you know, just realizing that you are only infinite consciousness and everything else, your emotions, your thoughts, everything that's happening outside of you is just a quick coming and going. And that's ultimately the realization that's going to lead you to true liberation, I think. I agree. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Now, once we do have that and we create our life as the meditation, how would you say that your avatar of Evan um, changes? Does it change? You know, is there a, a difference in will that comes about? Or a difference in, you know, just how you live your life altogether? Would you be able to get into that? Yeah. Um, so I'm a lot, just generally, I've just become, you know, even putting all the spiritual stuff aside, I'm just a much better person. The way that I treat other people, I'm way more pa patient, I'm more compassionate. Um, I think too, like, I don't know if, if, living like a hermit and like in a cave for your whole life is a good strategy because for me you know i still work a regular job and i still interact with regular people in the world and i feel like that that was actually really important for my growth because that's what really where i really was able to take all the spiritual stuff and like put it into practice like i think ram das has a quote like if you think you're enlightened to go spend some time with your family yep you know um so like that's where i really get to put myself and all of this stuff to the test and Rick really apply it, yeah. you know? So mm -hmm. I've just become overall way more like resilient. I can just like things don't really like very rarely do things bother me. I mean, there's some things that sort of still trigger me, but compared to who I was five, 10 years ago, it's just like it completely, I mean, I hate, it sounds like cliche, but just a completely different being really. Mm -hmm. Um, so just, you know, for my own personal growth, it's really just helped with that. I'm like, I'm way more confident. I'm way better speaker. Um, I just like, really the compassion is the biggest one that I like the, the, be the most, you know, just yeah. how more I can really just see that people are struggling and suffering and I can kind of be there for them. Even if I don't particularly like them, I could just, I mm -hmm. could see, like, I could see like the little hurt inner child in almost everybody. And I feel like it's my responsibility to kind of be there to, to, to not, um, to push these people, but to really, to, to, to help them if I could, you know? Um, so I would say that that's how the avatar has changed. Just sort of being this like person that can be there for other people to lean on if they need it. Um, but you also have to be careful. You have to learn how to set boundaries as well. You don't want to be too, yeah. get too, uh, wrapped up in that, that kind of character. But yeah. What would you say about that for you? That's very true. I like to say that my life becomes almost like an offering. Mm. An offering for this wavelength that we're speaking of, an offering of compassion. You yeah. don't have to take it, but I'm just throwing right. it out there. Right, right. I think that's how you don't get too wrapped up and you don't get too, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe submissive or passive to the world. So it walks all over you. Mm. Right. It's like, exactly. I'm just throwing it out there. If you don't want it, no strings attached. That's okay. Right, right. It's not like I'm out there hugging everybody in the streets. No. Nah. Type of thing. So, um, yeah. Because one could think if they, no one has any clue, which I do suspect people have a clue if they're listening, that this whole love and compassion and seeing everybody else is suffering, you become this like weak being. Not, I don't mm -hmm. know about weak, but like. I know what you mean. You become like yeah. a people pleaser. Like you feel like you have to yeah, then like sacrifice yes your own, your own yep. needs for everybody else. Like you have to make sure that your cup is always full. Mm -hmm. before you help everybody 
Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you develop that ability to, I guess, set those boundaries with other people, you know, to how to lend compassion, lend a hand to the people who actually need it and want it and who will appreciate it. But some people are just going to have to struggle on their own, you know? Mm-hmm. And you, I think you just get the, like the ability to kind of see to discern between that, you know? That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a huge, huge thing that comes from this wavelength is discernment. Uh, just a better judgment overall that transcends what the mind wants to tell you. Cause the mind stuff doesn't go away. At least personally speaking, there's always that voice. Oh yeah. Voice that wants to tempt you. Right. But before that you could say is this, uh, other voice that's not really even a voice i would say intuition and discernment is not a voice it's just like a a subtle resonance something just like a like a uh, i don't like a feeling right another sense it's another sense that will help guide you along the best path in whatever circumstance that comes from this right this meditative mindset allows one to tap into that so we can use the world as ram das would say grist for the mill to be able to, um, to be able to like shed light upon things like through the world so we can mm. act through the world. It's like, you know how to work, you know how to go with the flow better, I guess is what I'm trying to say through discernment. And, uh, yeah, that's also priceless, you know, it's, um, that's yeah, cool. <laughs> I would it's, say one thing to add on to that is like you, like the more that you get into this meditative, uh, lifestyle, and mm-hmm. you stop living so much from your ego, you start living more from your intuition. And uh, Nizar Gadada talks about this a lot. You just like, I don't know, I can't explain it. Like you just know what to do in every situation. You don't have to like yeah. think too hard. Like the whatever's supposed to happen, it just kind of like, you feel like called to it kind of. Yeah. Like even now when I'm talking to you right now, like the answers just come out. I'm not really sitting here like thinking too much about what to say. It's just kind of, everything just things, like it's just all sort of happening. And mm-hmm. the more that you stop, like the less that you're living up here and the more that you learn to feel and you learn to just be in reality and you get used to that, your body, you get used to just like literally just relaxing your body. You start to live more from your intuition and it's just, everything kind of just flows concurrently. You don't have to try too hard. I've noticed. Effortless. Um, do you, would you agree with that? Yeah. It becomes effortless in a way. It becomes effortless. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Effortless action. Effortless action. Yeah. <laughs> some sort of irony in there it's like actually i find too it makes me more proactive in my creative pursuits and just living all together utilizing this vehicle mm. there actually comes from it more energy but it's just directed in a more refined manner you could say a better manner Mm-hmm. And it doesn't feel like uh, I'm going against the grain. It feels right. like it's all going according to um, the Tao. You know, it's yeah. all going according to yeah. the plan. Yeah, that's that's what I find from it. There is just um, just like a sense of knowing that this is the right way, or vice versa. Also, knowing when I'm not on the right way. So the discernment. You know, I like to say this might be a simplified version of it but i'm a simple man it's like i know when something is good for me or bad for me like there's this very direct and strong yes or direct and strong no depending on the situation so um yeah from that from that is just like an ease of the action that comes from this body and um just a more fluidity of how this body should act according to the Tao or not <laughs> you know uh. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's powerful stuff. It, it really, really is very beautiful. powerful. I love these conversations. I don't have a lot of people that I talk to about this stuff in person. Like most of the conversations I have like about this are online. So it's good that yeah. we got to connect. But I think Seriously. the Tao is is a good... It's, I love Taoism for that reason. And I love how they teach that. Um, or Lao Tzu, how he, he, if he did it actually exist, uh, how he explains that, how the Tao, like everything is just... It's almost like a like a river, like the water is just sort of flowing and you, you have to kind of move with it, you know? Yeah. He who is not with me is against me. Exactly. <laughs> it's that essence. You're either with it or you ain't. Yeah. It's that simple. And uh, if you're not with it, it's going to cause suffering. If you're with it, it's 
going to be a smooth ride. It's really that simple, man. This really? whole wavelength we're talking about, you know, we're talking like you get superpowers and a sixth sense and yada, yada. And, you know, you find peace. Well, you find peace because you do find that there is this, um, this movement, this movement of energy. It's Shakti, right? Mm. And you have to, you have to be with it, man. You have to surrender, right? There is the sovereignty that for sure comes from this vantage point. I feel as though I can do whatever I want. Life is but a dream and you can become lucid in the dream and create it however you want. That's the beauty of it, right? You realize ultimate freedom. But yet, within this vantage point of ultimate freedom, I find that the best way to utilize this will and ultimate freedom is to surrender to this greater force that mm. yes we are a part of and you can either you can either create against it or create co-create with it and if you want to have a smooth ride here you better co-create with it <laughs> right it's really that drastic and um yeah that's it that's uh that's the pull of the light or the dark like you can try to create your own world like lucifer try to become your own god or you can create with God. And if you create with God, you realize that's the purpose of this whole thing is you realize God and then you start to create alongside God. You serve, like we talked about servantry, right? You serve the others, you serve the people, the others in your community around you. But you also, in that servitude, there is this essence of serving a greater force, like the force that created you, that created this whole thing. You're co-creating alongside that other force that is ultimately benevolent and ultimately it's love and that is that's it that's the i find in this realization that's like the pinnacle and purpose of this whole life it's like you serve slash create alongside the creator that manifested you in the first place mm -hmm. and that's how we become happy i believe <laughs> and that might sound grandiose but it's really not no, I hope it didn't sound too grandiose, but it's really, it's actually really, really simple too. That's the thing, right? We have these grand revelations, but it's so simple. As you said, you just slow down, that discernment will guide the way in whatever, however it comes up in your life. And you just follow that. It's so simple. It is huge because in that essence, we're creating a new earth, a new world, right? We're creating the kingdom of heaven, you could say. But it happens in all the little moments of our life. We create it anew in all the small moments of our life. Like, uh, I don't know, uh, you give money to the homeless guy, give him five bucks. You tip the barista, you ask somebody how they're doing, they're not looking too good, you know, they're looking a little off, you be there for them. Just in all of the little interactions that we have, that's how we pave the way for a new world, you know? Mm. And this is the new world that we were supposed to live in, I believe, you know, and that we ultimately will get to. I don't know how long it's going to take. It might be hundreds of years, thousands of years, 10 years. Who knows? But I do feel as though in this, this whole, what this whole thing is about is having a realization that how we've been living is just chaos. It's according to something that isn't actually what a human being is um incarnated here for mm. yeah do you feel that do you feel as though like we're creating this new earth as Eckhart Tolle says literally in a in our own lives for sure like we're creating a new earth a new life but also on the collective physical level earth altogether we're paving the way for a whole different um just a whole different alien world in a way um hmm I don't think I could speak on that too much. I don't know. I haven't thought about that too much. I think of it more in terms of just us people as a collective, as our You're probably better mind. off thinking like that. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. I, I Keep hear it simple. People, sometimes I hear people talk about, you know, I think you interviewed Aaron Apke at one point. Do you know him? Yeah. I think he talks ago. a lot about, what was it? It was a few years ago. It was a few years ago. Yeah. yeah. He, he goes on a lot about that kind of stuff. And I, I don't know. I just don't, it doesn't resonate with me so much right now. Maybe I just don't really understand it, but he talks a lot about like four dimension and five dimension and yeah, alien yeah. consciousness and stuff. And maybe I'm just not there yet. Um, I don't know, but if there's anything you would want to touch on with that, feel free. I, I don't really have an answer so much to that kind of stuff. I respect that. I think I said enough.
<laughs> I yapped on enough about that. It's um really just think about it though. If we're just creating a better life for ourselves, and that's just innate, that just comes with the territory, mm. then inevitably the world is going to have to change. And if more and more people are getting on this wavelength, it's going to reach a point of um. Uh, what is that when a certain amount of people get on like uh damn it i forgot the word when a certain amount of people it reaches like a breaking point i forget mm-hmm. the critical mass i think it's called okay. critical mass like a certain amount of people get to a certain point of awakening and i think it's gonna shift to 4d or 5d i don't think necessarily to everybody has to be on this wavelength i think it has to do with like a certain amount the um 144,000, as they say in the bible something along those lines where a certain amount of people get to this and then that just shifts the world not even necessarily into a new dimension i don't really like to speak like that because that's like that gets trippy yeah yeah but it will appear as a new dimension like say all of a sudden we do create this new world it takes a hundred years just out of love just out of our basic servitude Mm -hmm. of our life and um from that new inventions come new ways of living, there's no more war. I know this may sound utopian, but say we do create that utopia through all of our little moments of our life. Close your eyes right now, and all of a sudden you're teleported into that that world that we're um, hypothetically speaking about. It would appear as a new dimension, right? It would appear as in the physicality of it, as you're not in the same world. (laughs) So I think that's what people speak of. It's still, it's still, there's no like, you're not going anywhere. It's always here and now. Oh, okay. I think I was I was overcomplicating it. Maybe <laughs> it's just a whole different way of how the world will be at that time. Is that all that? Like, I just don't know what, yeah. what does that look like. Like fourth dimension, fifth dimension. Like, does that? That's mean- what I'm saying. Like, I don't. I don't think anyone can really. I think we'll just have higher technology. We'll have higher ways of of communicating with each other. You know, we'll more essentially just be like more people will be on this wavelength with aligned with the Tao. And mm-hmm. it will appear as like we traveled to a different dimension. We went through a wormhole or something like that, yada, yada. But that's not actually what's happening. We're just like, we're, it's still, you can't go anywhere. It's always right. here. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you going to go? So just here is going to change up its representation, I guess you could say, to the consciousness. Like it's, um, we change it. But if you were to, I'm kind of getting lost here. So like, getting back to like if you close your eyes in a hundred years you're teleported into that world it would appear as though you created a new dimension as if you went somewhere else but no you didn't go anywhere (laughs) you're still on earth i get what you're saying but that's a reason why i don't like to speak of 4d and 5d i've said it before but it can seem so like lofty yeah exactly going into a different dimension like in right uh, yeah it doesn't make any sense it's like we're going through a wormhole or you're time traveling but i think like like that all that means to me then, like from what you just explained, if mm-hmm. what that would look like a hundred, however many years from now, is that we would be operating from a place of love instead of fear. That's it. Things like poverty and third world countries would be a thing of the past. There's no yeah. reason that countries should still be the way that they are, considering America has all, you know, as much money and power as we have. Yeah. Things like that, like we'll start, we won't be operating from a place of greed anymore. We'll be operating from a place of compassion and wanting to help others um and like you know like maybe that now probably that won't work like maybe people have radical ideas about you know marxism and, and marxism and socialism and maybe that won't really work right now but i think that that's probably the direction that we need to head in at some point you know mm-hmm. um where we kind of live in this where everything is sort of equal but I understand why some people think that that's not the answer right now. I get that. But I think that that's ultimately what this 4D, 5D dimension will look like. Yeah. Um, or this world. It would just be every, but nobody's on like the, or not, maybe not nobody, but most people aren't going to be so low on the scale of consciousness. They're going to raise, they're not going to be operating from fear and hate and anger. It's going to be more from love. And I think it's just a very natural sort of progression that. Mm-hmm. Um, will probably take hundreds of years, I would say, realistically, maybe even more, maybe thousands. But I just think it's like, that's our job is to like, just wake. That's my job. I say all the time, like, just wake as many people up from this dream as I possibly can before I die. That's it. Like, I don't really care. My, My life is very simple. I don't care about much else. I don't care about fame. I don't really care about wealth that much. Like, uh, if that stuff comes with it, that's fine, but that's not my prerogative. 
my prerogative is just to get the message out there for everybody and whatever comes from that, it just, uh, I'll just adapt to it, you know? Amen. It's quite noble. And also again, simple in that way, just mm. keeping that one wavelength, you know, overcomplicating it, just saying, Hey man, I'm just, I'm here just trying to shine some light. I feel the same way. I'm just trying at least. And the thing is we can't do it for anybody. We're just here kind of, um, just talking about it almost as a testament, you know, mm. we're just given a little bit of proof maybe that this is real or a little bit of hope for others to be able to see this. But at the end of the day, I think we spoke about this in the beginning. Ultimately it comes back to you and you only and that could mm. sound a little daunting, a little scary. I understand that because in some kind of way, I think we're conditioned into looking for some sort of savior. Prime example is Jesus, right? Mm. Everyone wants Jesus to come back and save the world. And I think that comes from childhood trauma, like you want your parents to save you. And that's that's a whole psychology thing that I don't even want to get into. Mm. But we're all looking for some kind of somebody to save us, right? Somebody to be there and to hold us in their arms. But it's really not about that. It's about being open and free with yourself and vulnerable and uh, saving yourself, exactly. <laughs> essentially. Yeah, it's a tough pill to swallow, I could see, but in the end, it's worth it. So the testament that we can provide hopefully is that this journey that isn't really a journey is worth it this whole introspection this path of self-inquiry and introspection is 100 percent worth it it may seem a little scary at first i get it 100 percent, i get it but if you go through that take the time to meditate um and disconnect from all the craziness especially now with uh the election going on the election, in the United States. Yeah, like it's yeah. just so much, so much. But that's not going to let up anytime soon. That's not going to, the yeah. craziness is only going to get more and more dense. Right. So if you can just like just simply disconnect from all of that, you may be able to find a little bit of peace and stillness amongst the storm, you know? Become the eye of the storm and you go through it. That's the thing. Some symbolism in there. You got to go through it in order to define this peace, you know? It's interesting how the eye of the storm in the center of it is completely peaceful, right? I think there's something special about that. There's some symbolism to that. Mm. In the center of all of us is this complete and still stillness, peace, that all around is, it's not affected by what's all around us. So yeah, there's something poetic about that. But yeah, point of my story is, <laughs> point of my story is that we are just like, uh, we're just like symbols in ourselves to hopefully shine the way and guide others to this, right? And um, yeah, that's what I find is the highest value of guidance and teaching is bringing one back to oneself. Like mm -hmm. any good guru, any good teacher is just somebody that shines you back to you mm -hmm. and is the offering and doesn't need anything from you. They're just there. They're being themselves. They're just, they're just sturdy in their understanding and are able to convey it without needing money, fame, anything from you. They're just a prime example for you to go back to you, the, to the guru within. And um, yeah, man, that's why I like to speak to people like you <laughs> because uh, it's also a reminder for myself to come on here and, and speak like this. You know, hopefully for anybody listening, if there is anybody listening, but also um, as a reminder to myself that uh, it's all up to me. <laughs> I think it's important to remember that, like uh, for anybody listening, like whatever you might be looking for in an external God or whatever you might be looking for, if you still believe in Jesus or just anything, like always just bring bring that back to you. Like you have the power yep. and the ability for whatever you might be searching for in them or in a guru or whoever, like you have that ability to find that within yourself. And that's the point of this work is yes. understanding like you don't need anything outside of yourself. It's all within you. And mm -hmm. that's self-realization is realizing that you have everything right, right here. It's right in front of you. It's right under your nose. You just got to find it. You just got to see it. But you're so blocked by all the nonsense that you've been so conditioned to believe your whole life. And you got to, that's what like one of the main points, like, or not points, but one of the biggest parts of this type of work is like just unlearning all of that yeah. and just sit, just being like a child, like a little kid, little mm -hmm. kids don't worship God and stuff. They just, 
live. They just exist and they just love life. And that's what we want to get back to that childlike state, you know? That's it. Yep. Unless you become like children, then you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Exactly. Like said. <laughs> exactly. That's the thing too, is you can, with this understanding, start to analyze the teachings of Jesus and the gurus, anybody, any sage differently. Mm, right. Right. Jesus makes a lot more sense. All of his words it make does. a lot more it sense. It really does. <laughs> I noticed yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because I grew up going to Catholic school and I always rejected it. And I was always like, you know, I don't like, because, you know, at that age, you're rebellious. And I still don't particularly like what society has turned Christianity and Islam into. However, when you... Backwards. Yeah. When you... When you go and like really understand the actual teachings of Jesus and, or, or any spiritual figure, you know, first of all, they're all basically saying the same thing, just yep. in different languages, different time periods, different geographical parts of the world, but it's all the same underlying message. Right. Um, so it's, I think that's, but you know, I used to say, I hate Christianity. Like I don't hate Christianity. I just like most things. I don't like what humans turned it into. Mm -hmm. um but i think there can be value and i think that's important is to find like what works for you whether whether it's advaita vedanta whether it's buddhism whether it's christianity like find what speaks to you and sort of use that as guidance to to um find it within yourself you know yep mm -hmm. the truth is one and the wise called by many names mm. yeah so find whatever wise man or woman will allow you to align back to you it's that simple right really exactly is. for me personally yeah, it's ramana maharshi he was like the biggest oh, biggest yeah. influence for me what what was yeah. yours i have so many or just uh, or you said ram das was a really ram das one. and i've just been diving into very recently the words of jesus that's mm. why i've been quoting him a lot on this pod and previous pods i'm actually reading simultaneously right now a course in miracles in the new testament oh it's an interesting experience to like to see because they're both you know of course miracles supposed to be channeled from jesus and new testament is obviously yeah. about jesus so it's interesting to like read one say one gospel and then go into a course in miracles and just analyze them both like have this different vantage point on what the new testament is supposed to mean mm -hmm. and it's uh yeah it's awesome man you really start to see how powerful of a figure jesus was in that way oh he was he was amazing yeah yeah just not in the dogmatic form. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, yeah. I have The Course in Miracles. I just never read it. But um, oh, are man. you familiar? Have you heard of the Gnostic Gospels at all? They're mm -hmm. like the, like the, they were only found, I think, in the last few hundred years. And they were apparently yeah. like Jesus's true message. I don't know a yeah. lot about them, but it's something that I've been interested in researching. Oh, you got it, man. Have you read yeah. the Gospel of Thomas? I'm No, I haven't read it. That's put that at that, the top of your list. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. not in the Bible, right? That's one no, of the. It that's be one of the, the Bible, but it's not. Okay. It's, uh, I would say it's the purest teachings of Jesus from a non-dual perspective as well. Really? It's not, yeah. There's no. It's very direct. It's okay. extremely direct. Um, some of the parts in there are a little hard to understand. It's sort of poetic, and I think mm. it got lost in translation. But you will find if you approach it from a non-dual point of view, from this new age quote-unquote point of view you'll be able to really really see what jesus was speaking about i would say if anybody doesn't have any clue who jesus is which i suspect everybody knows who jesus is at yeah. this point but if they didn't hypothetically the first thing that you should dive into to understand what jesus was saying is the gospel of thomas 100 okay. before you go into any other gospel anything else in the new testament the gospel of thomas would do it for you i would say you don't even need to read the new testament if you really want to understand what jesus was saying just read the gospel of thomas the other um the other gnostic gospels are just some of them are really out there mm, i <laughs> think mary them, magdalene had one too right yep mm -hmm. yeah i had a night where i just went through reading them all i mean many many nights of reading them all and they're um they're very profound they're very very different from the actual um the, what's that called the, the regular bible you know it's like yeah the, uh, yeah just from the term for it i'll put that also down at the bottom but the you know the, the regular bible is way different from what they put into the bible and uh yeah you gotta think too like how much was lost through time and you know maybe there's other places like the nag Hammadi. uh was it nag Hammadi? i think that's where they found it yeah egypt that's what sure. I'm, I'm looking at right now 
yeah it's in the place in egypt it's so funny that you brought this up because i was just i like just the past few days i've just all like had this weird inclination to want to understand jesus's teachings and oh, um man. well the so gospel of thomas man i would recommend that after we get I'm off gonna, this call <laughs> i'm gonna i am literally can, is it something you can like um order like or is it where do you where'd you read it Get it's it just, online? Yeah, it's just public. It's free online. Okay, just search cool. the Gospel of Thomas. I'm pretty sure one of the first results, it'll be up there for you. Gotcha. It's pretty short. It's not like, it's not that long. Oh, okay. Um, but it's very, very succinct in the teachings. Yeah. My point was, you got to wonder like how much other stuff is lost out there. Because mm -hmm. that was found in a cave in 1940 something. Right. Right. So almost 2000 years, those teachings went unnoticed and nobody had any clue that the Gospel of Thomas or the, the other Gospels, the other Gnostic Gospels were even mm -hmm. around. What about other Gospels? There's got to be other places. There's got to be other stuff as well. Or even stuff that was burned at the Library of Alexandria. Mm. You know how much knowledge we probably lost? We'd probably be able to build UFOs by now if we had, <laughs> if we had stuff in there. Actually, I do think we're building UFOs and all of that. That's a, this is a whole other story, but I do think... This is a sidetrack here. I do think those things that we... Those craft that people are seeing nowadays is just... Um, they're just like prototype UFOs that is like, it's like, that's technology that we're not supposed to know about. So I think people are claiming them as UAPs and UFOs. That's a whole side topic and sidetrack that I don't think do you really believe, to um, to. although it's not directly related, but I would be curious. Do you believe mm -hmm. that we definitely have had contact with extraterrestrials and that the government hides it? I go back and forth Me on too. that. Yeah. It's hard to say. Either way, there is the phenomena of the flying craft and you got to mm. wonder where it came from because I either, so this is my two things that I weigh in my head that there is, and this is the, this is the paradigms, right? Right now you have the UFO people, we're in contact with them and it's extremely secret, right? We're not supposed to know about it. They're here. They might even be here communicating with us. Mm. I could see that or that these craft that we see that it's pretty obvious at this point that the evidence is real these craft that we see were just like um, were found from a civilization that was here thousands, maybe even millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. Right. And that there were other beings here at this point. I mean, at some point, but at this point we're just finding their technology. Like we're unearthing their technology that was left here, almost mm -hmm. like a donation. And I don't know. I don't know what to believe. I would say more realistically is that we just found this technology that was here, maybe from um, some kind of ancient civilization and they left. And we just found that, reverse engineered it. And uh, just at this point in time, we're coming to actually be able to use it in some way. I mean, I have no idea, to be honest with you. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? I go back and forth, like I said, but same with you. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't know. I just don't think aliens, I think aliens would probably be so advanced that they, like, I don't think it's something that the government's going to be able to hide. Like, I, I you know what I mean? Yeah. I think they, would, they would, if they want to talk to us, like, they'll do whatever they want. Um, or mm -hmm. how do we know? We always assume that aliens are so advanced, but maybe they're not. Maybe there's just like a planet full of dogs or something like, you know, it's probably mean? both. It's probably <laughs> advanced. There's probably the dog planet yeah and us in between that maybe yeah maybe spectrum there's, there's probably a spectrum there's probably so many different species of living beings out there that we really have no idea it's not something i like i try not to spend too much time thinking about things that i'm not going to be able to yeah. you know resolve it just seems kind of pointless sometimes but it it's is something fun. it's an interesting thing it's like fun to to you know talk about once in a while but yeah well ultimately i think that we're not at the top of the totem pole if oh, this no. is some kind of process of evolution, as we spoke of before, mm. then we're evolving to a higher species, right? And that involves the technology will evolve with us, right? Or we evolve the technology into being some kind of higher species. Well, most likely, most likely we're not at the, uh, at the, at the top of the evolution. Top. Right. Yeah. Like, how could we be? I don't think, right, I okay. feel as though we're so, um, we're so faulty. There's right. got to be more advanced beings that maybe even created us. Who knows? Like, I don't know how that goes. Maybe life just creates life. But point of my story is that, um, I don't know, you come to find a sort of humility in what, in what the human condition is. And I think aliens, yeah, it's fun, but it can give you a little bit of perspective on how um, we're not 
a little less egocentrism, I guess you could say, in the whole scheme of things, in the whole scheme mm. of life and consciousness altogether. So yeah, you can get lost in rabbit holes about aliens and who knows what is the government hiding it. But ultimately, if you want to, like we said, bring it back into yourself, every teaching brings it back into yourself, you'll be able to understand um, more about yourself in terms of in terms of evolution, right? You could just use that as uh, an example that we're not we're not the top. We're not at the top. And that's actually the good news. <laughs> right? Yeah. Imagine if we were at the top. That would be kind of scary. I yeah, was just say what? I was thinking recently like imagine if aliens did present themselves to us and they wanted to wage some kind of war on us. Like imagine how quickly every country in this world would ban would be yeah. allies like in an instant because we had no choice it would be survival at that point because we have to fight against the aliens yeah it just goes to show you that like everything we're fighting over is completely pointless like oh my God. you know every war, war. Is, is just ridiculous i mean it's just crazy and you know when you become awakened you really see it like it really affects you like i never was big into caring so much about politics in like the middle east but now it like it breaks my heart to just know that people are dying for no reason whatsoever you know Mm -hmm. um but again that's just how we're evolving unfortunately people just get caught in that yeah yeah you see how silly it is it really is futile it is it's so silly maybe silly isn't even the right word no but like it is silly it's like that that's i describe it as silly as well because it's it's just so pointless like you know Mm -hmm. and that's a good point if we were to realize that we're actually one family and we're all in this together in that we're, uh, there's other beings. Mm. I do think there are other beings. I do think there are other there beings. There has to be. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Whether there's the like, craft we're seeing are, are the other beings or they're us, that's what's like kind of like, I don't know, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, but I do yeah. think there are there are very, very advanced beings. And if they were to come here, yeah, we'd it would be like an ego death for everybody. Right. Like, what the fuck? Wait, wait, what? What is this thing? And um, yeah, I think ultimately it would lead us to to all band together. Mm. I think just the natural laws of the universe, the laws of love, though, also apply to those advanced beings. And an alien takeover wouldn't wouldn't be in that form like we see in the movies because they're in the same universe and abide to the laws of karma as we do. So it's right. Like, we're kind of going off here. No, yeah. No, <laughs> how, how I don't you get to talking would, about this stuff. I don't think it would be like that either. I think. Uh... <laughs> But even so, like it would, even if they, if it wasn't like War of the Worlds, like it would still be scary for us. Oh well. yeah, you know, like Maybe we would still we probably band to get, band to get. We would have to because it would be so like, you know, yeah. everything would change. Well, I think that's what's happening with AI, man. I think we're creating the alien, and this is an idea of Terence McKenna: is the alien intelligence is really just artificial intelligence, and we're going to mm. come to be presented with that. We already are presented with that. I mean, the fact mm. that we have the stuff that we have now, to me, is mind blowing. But yeah, as time goes is. on, we're going to find that this this super intelligence that is way greater than us is something that we created and right. it's here on Earth. We're bringing this into fruition through our mm. own will. And that's even trippier, I feel like, than the mothership coming down and laying, landing on the White House lawn is that we're creating this, this right, new right. life form. And uh, yeah, I think that's going to lead to a big ego death. It's going to put into perspective of who and what we really are and what our consciousness is, is and what our intelligence is in the human form. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the aliens are here, but the thing is, is we're creating the aliens. <laughs> interesting. I never thought of it that way. It kind of yeah, reminds me of, take. are you familiar with the plot of the Terminator? Yeah. Basically artificial intelligence becomes so advanced that it wages a war against humanity is essentially yeah. the yeah so I, think, I always thought that was interesting because that's like basically what's going to probably happen at some you think it'll wage war Hopefully probably not, not but it's mm. interesting to think about if it, it becomes so like self-aware at some point maybe it could i don't know mm. it definitely could that's for sure you gotta call john connor yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because you got to wonder, it's like, does the AI know that what we're doing is destructive and that see, if we can see the silliness and the futility of all of our actions, the AI, the super intelligence is obviously going to be able to see it. Mm. And then at that point, does it take um, take a hold of our systems and use it against us to ultimately destroy us so it doesn't get destroyed itself? <laughs> I don't know, man. Who knows? 
either way, that doesn't really matter. We're just having some fun here. It's kind yeah, of entertainment. Yeah. He's got to come back and be here now. <laughs> <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. But that is uh, that is the times we're living in. You know, that is the dream that is being presented to us before our very eyes, and it's getting interesting to say the least. May you be born in interesting times. Well, these are the times. These are the times. You know, um, yeah, yeah, man. Ultimately, it doesn't matter though. To anyone listening, that's all noise. We just got lost in the noise, yeah. interesting noise, but it's all part of this. It's all the story, you know, and that story really ultimately doesn't matter to one's self realization, one's, uh, one's liberation in this life. No matter what goes on, Skynet or no Skynet, <laughs> be here now. Come back in, take a big breath. Ah, <sighs> all is good. It's that simple. Um, yeah, man, but I think this was a good talk. Uh, I don't Hopefully. know how we got onto the topic of aliens, but I'm glad we talked about it. <laughs> and I thank you for coming on here, man. I think we can start to wrap it up. Do you have uh, anything you want to get off your chest, though, before we stop recording? No, just anybody who might be listening and who's uh, maybe new to this or even not, um, just remember something you said earlier that I really liked is just remember your smaller actions throughout the day. Yes, remember... If you're in a position of making a decision, just always take a minute, yeah. slow down, take a breath. The answers are always within you, but sometimes we're just so caught up with thinking and we have so much tension in our body due to anxiety, which is, you know, this is my most recent videos have been a lot about this. You know, you got to learn to just relax and just let everything go. And whatever you're struggling with in life, whatever decisions you're trying to make, even small things, um, I would say that those are the most important moments for you, you know, how mm -hmm. you treat others in every moment and how you treat yourself, how you talk to yourself. So just remember that if you're confused, if some of this sounds overwhelming, don't worry about it. Just take what works for you, leave the rest. Um, but just really start to shine your awareness on every second of the day. That would I be said. my last, like my final words. Amen. Very well said, man. I appreciate you coming on here. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. I think this was awesome. Me too. You're right, though. It all starts with the breath. It really does. You can always come back to your breath. We're always breathing, no breath. matter what's going on. Breath is never happening in the past or the future. It's only ever happening in the present moment. So remember that. If you're ever just like you're stuck up here or whatever, just remember, you always come back to your breath. You're, you can always be safe in the present moment on your breath. As uh, the yoga physicist says, you the present in the present moment you're guarded by the armor of reality so remember that <sighs> thank you evan yes sir this was awesome appreciate you keep doing your thing and that's it i wish you all the best and uh yeah thank you to anybody that listened this long as well peace and love to you and peace and love to the listener all Goodbye, right y'all